I'm with a very important person here today at the Benson Henry Institute at Harvard and Mass General in Boston. My guest is Dr. Jay Glazer. Thank you very much for joining and namaste to you. My pleasure. Jay is one of the earliest medical persons on Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's team, has a long story uh, 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 helping Maharishi set up the whole Ayurveda, uh, his meditation, his Ayurveda since the early 1970s, long before Deepak Chopra entered this. And uh, he will tell us about the rise and the spread of this whole Maharishi system and how he brought not only meditation but also uh, Ayurveda, also Jyotish, uh, you know, sacred music, all of that kind of stuff. That Maharishi was a real pioneer ahead of his time. And he'll tell us how Deepak Chopra entered the scene, how, how what all happened, uh, a lot of history of Ayurveda and how this affected uh, the rise of Ayurveda in India as a mirror effect, as an echo effect. So tell us your background and how you got started in this. Well, I was uh, a medical student at the University of Colorado and I uh, took some time off to, uh, it was actually a, an elective that I did in India because I had one of my professors was um, a visiting professor from All India Institute of Medical Science. Um, I learned Transcendental Meditation in 1972 um, because uh, this was a time when uh, a lot of kids my age, in the, say the, their 20s, early 20s, were starting to uh, learn meditation. And, um, from Mah Maharishi's group in India from, or here? From Maharshi, who um, really had um, abandoned the idea of trying to get meditation going in India. He knew that people in India would take it up, not just meditation, but all the Vedic sciences, if the people took it up in the West, because he'd seen that that's the way it worked anyway. So he left India after spending um, his youth with uh, Swami Sar, uh, Brahmananda Saraswati, yes. who is the Shankaracharya of Jyotirmant. Yes. He, and uh, after um, Swami Brahmananda Saraswati, uh, or known Gurudev, um, passed on, um, Maharshi went into the caves of Uttarkashi. And he had this vision, after spending many years there, I should go to the south and give the blessings of the Himalayas to the people in the south. So he went down there and he never came back to the Himalayas to his cave. Instead, he found that the reception was so great that he started the Transcendental Meditation Movement. In the south? In, yeah, in the south, in Madras, mm -hmm. Chennai now. And, um, and that's where it started, was uh, in 1953. And he was teaching throughout India during all these years. And finally, he realized this is going too slow. How many people will I have to initiate myself? He did the math and he realized he was going to have to make it much bigger. So in 1955, I think, he came out for the first time and got to Hawaii, gave his first talk. Hawaii. Hawaii, in, uh, in Honolulu. He gave his first talk about Transcendental Meditation. 1955. Yeah. And the, the people, uh, the, the, the next day in the newspapers, it said, Transcendental Meditation, non-drug sleeping pill. A non-drug sleeping and pill. And she said, oh my God. They're in India, they use this for enlightenment, and here they're using it for sleeping. He said, whatever it takes to get them to take it up. Now, through the 1960s, he was teaching and became very popular. Uh, the Beatles took it up. And Beatles went, came to Rishikesh. Beatles came to Rishikesh, and uh, I think that was 1967 or so. And uh, they spent, um, he had the ashram in Rishikesh on the other side of the Ganga. Uh, literally in the jungle, um, and uh, and he realized that he was going to have to make TM teachers. So he made, literally, from 67 to 1972, thousands of young hippies. Um, at his request, he said, "This is never going to fly if uh, you know, the, you know, it's the hippie movement that starts this." So he said, "You want to be a TM teacher? You shave your beards." put on a tie, and um, take it to the masses. 
So I started the in Western 19- masses first. The Western masses first. Mm. So I started in 1972 as a wave of these young kids. And, you know, I'd tried many meditations before, and I said, why should I pay $25 for a mantra when, you know, you can get one out of a book or something? But as soon as I started, I knew it's not just having some word, it's the way you use it. And this is what TM did. It gives you a very systematic approach to how to, not just which mantra to use, but how to use it. And a system that we can support people as they start in their meditation. So literally hundreds of thousands, literally within a few years, millions of people started transcendental meditation at that time. I learned in the 70s. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. And he was on the Merv Griffin show and many, you know, on TV. He had so many celebrities there. Exactly. After him. So I was meditating all through medical school and I went to India in 1972, just a few months after I um, learned TM. And uh, during my first rotation on the wards of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, I saw a patient with TB and he had a little pile of herbs on his uh, bedside stand. Which year was that? This was 1972, the fall of 72. Okay. And so I said to my professor that I was staying at his home in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, I said, is there an indigenous medicine of India? And he said, yeah, there is. And he took me down and he showed me um, a few artifacts that they had in a a case down on the, the ground floor. And he said, and we have an office of indigenous sciences here too, medical science. So I went up and I met a guy who was, you know, doing a few experiments with, you know, herbs. And he said, you know, if you really want to learn Ayurveda, you have to go see my father. And his father was a Dr. Dwivedi, who was the uh, dean of the Sanskrit medical, uh, Sanskrit college, and the Ayurveda division of Sanskrit college. Dr. Dwivedi. Dwivedi. In, in Delhi? In Benares. In Benares. Sanskrit college. Okay. In Benares. So I went there. Which year was that? 72? This was 72. Okay. I went to Benares. And I not only visited Sanskrit college, but also I went to Benares Hindu University. And I also apprenticed myself out to all the best Ayurvedic doctors I could find in 1972 in India. But it was very impressive. I I met Dr. P.J. Deshpande, Mm -hmm. who uh, was at BHU, Benares Hindu University in Benares. And he was the person who was trying to revive Ayurvedic surgery. Uh And there's a technique called Kshara Sutra, which is used for treating rectal fistulas. Hmm. And he took me out in the garden and he showed me, now this is milkweed, and you can get a resin out of the milkweed, and you can coat these strings with the resin 23 times, and the last coating you put on turmeric, so it has no uh, allergic response. And then you put that through the fistula, tie it off, and the enzyme in the milkweed slowly cuts through the tissue, and then until it comes out to the surface. And this is actually a technique very similar to what we do today. Mm. And this is described in Sushruta, the ancient book of surgery. Right. So I apprenticed myself out to him, did some surgery with him, um, and uh, met many other great physicians, and learned, interestingly, this concept of using one herb called ekamula compared to using many, many different herbs in one package. You, learning the different branches and the different schools of philosophy of Ayurveda. To make a long story short, I came back after having done that and I wrote what I think is the, one of the first theses in the West about Ayurveda and I presented it to the medical school and they took it which medical school was it? The University of Colorado. Colorado, okay. Which year? This was 1973. Okay. By the time I got back and wrote the thesis and I was about to graduate. And they took it as a very well-researched historical perspective of a quaint medical science. Something exotic. Right. Maybe that, that may, may, not not be, have, may not be very scientific. It does but not have any modern implications. Right. And I said, no, that's not the point. The point is, Ayurveda is a brilliant science that has many modern implications because 
in the West, yeah, we might have antibiotics and we might have modern surgery, but nowadays we've conquered all the infectious diseases and the diseases of modern medicine are the ones of chronic disease that you can get up over a lifetime, build up calcifications and get heart disease and so many different diseases. So now that we have antibiotics and we have um, civil engineering that's given us toilets and good hygiene, still we get old and we age and we have all these problems that come up that Ayurveda can help us to solve. Right. Diseases of cr chronic diseases. And that's a bit the point of my book. That's why we don't use Ayurveda these days for treating appendicitis or taking out a gallbladder. We use it for the diseases that can really be helped that Western medicine has no approach for. Um, through all these years I was meditating and when I met Maharshi, for the, when I graduated from medical school, I realized, okay, now I've l learned my specialty internal medicine and I've gotten my advanced diplomas in that field, but now I need to go learn real medicine. So I apprenticed myself out to Maharshi for about 10 years. Wow, starting in? In 1977, 78, I joined full time into the Transcendental Meditation Movement and worked in many different capacities there. Um, I joined a group of young men, uh, most of them young, a couple of them old, <laughs> but um, most of the people in Maharshi's movement at that time were my age, you yes. know, by then we were in our 30s um, instead of our 20s when we all learned TM. And, um, you know, I went from one day I was uh, doing procedures in an emergency room and the next day I found myself chopping veggies at uh, Maharshi University of Management in Iowa, joining a group of men who were um, brahmacharis. And I stayed in that life for about um, 10 years. Wow. And uh, during this time, we, uh, I was always asking Maharshi, when are we going to be um, opening up this great science of Ayurveda? Because I'd been studying Ayurveda and reading the texts and learning the Sanskrit. And so this is the first wave of Maharishi's uh, knowledge transferred to the West, which was meditation, transfer, the transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. And now the next wave that you wanted to bring was Ayurveda. Yes, but Maharshi knew, the, he said, the people in the West aren't even meditating. Ah. Now we're going to start to talk to them about oils and herbs and they'll get the wrong idea. The essence of all these Vedic sciences for Maharshi is the raising of consciousness, bringing higher states of consciousness, because if you can do that, everything else happens by itself. You teach a person how to meditate and he gains that ability to have pure consciousness in his awareness. He opens his eyes after meditation and he doesn't go smoke and drink and carry on and do all the things that cause the chronic diseases to come on. Mm. And so he said, why should we talk about herbs and oils and panchakarma if we can do one simple thing to a man, teach him transcendental meditation and he gains everything else all at once. So that's why from 1953, 55, when he came out of the Himalayas until 1980, he didn't speak a word about those other things. Or if he did, it would only be among his very close contacts like right. myself. Because the West was not ready for them. They weren't ready for that. But finally in 1980, after a group of physicians like myself had gotten together and met with him, he went to India and he came back with um, Dr. V. and Dwivedi from Jamnagar. Right. Now I should mention, Jamnagar was one of the universities that was the, one of the very first to make Ayurveda an academic subject. Mm. Right after partition, that opened up. There was brilliant uh, Vaidyas that went to Jamnagar and that were from Jamnagar and Gujarat and they came like Dr. Dwivedi. And they were reintroducing and making these uh, Ayurvedic sciences, uh, you know, into something that w would be studied as an academic discipline. 
it was there before as academia, but mostly Ayurveda before that was learned one-to-one -one with a guru or mm. a few people studying at the feet of a master right. and going into the woods with the master. Now, you're going to have this taught and get a degree in Ayurveda. So, he brought Dr. V. Vedi back to the West and he was very famous for trying to uh, bring the science of Basma to, right. to the West. And he, uh, and then we had a course at that time in, in New Delhi, and um, Dr. Uh, Triguna, yes, was one of the people that were was at the course, and then a little bit later, a few years later, he had um, Balraj Maharshi from uh, the from Andhra Pradesh, mm -hmm. who really learned. All of the three of them learned mainly as in, in, from a guru. Right. And Maharshi took them together, bringing the science of Ayurveda, and from his side, making sure that as we introduce Ayurveda to the West, we're going to be introducing it as a consciousness based discipline. Very good. Always coming back to those fundamental principles of Ayurveda. For example, this idea of prajñāparād, meaning mm. the mistake of the intellect, which Maharshi localizes as the essence of all the knowledge of Ayurveda in one sutra, which means if you, the sutra basically says, if you have this mistake of the intellect, which is not distinguishing from the eternal and the non-eternal, then you'll violate all the laws of nature. Right. But if you can recognize what's eternal and make that through your meditation and your yoga practices and wh whatever else, and bring that eternal into your daily experience, making immortality a part of your daily experience, then you won't violate the laws of nature and you won't bring on disease. So as Maharshi brought Ayurveda to the West, it was always in the context of these concepts. So Maharishi wanted to not be reductionist and say, okay, Ayurveda will treat this thing or that thing. Uh, he wanted to put it in the big context of consciousness. Exactly. Even with respect to simple things. For example, he brings out the fallacy of the active ingredient. When I visited Barn Banaras Hindu University, all the labs there were busily taking some plant and crushing them and trying to put them in alcohol or some aqueous solution and trying to localize the active ingredient. The, the active mo one molecule. Exactly. Which molecule is it in this plant that's giving the ingredient? And Maharshi's point was, no, when you take that out of the plant and you give it as one. For example, we have reserpine, which is a, a wonderful you know, plant coming from the Raoulfia, a, a wonderful drug, we can say, coming from the Raoulfia plant. When you take Raoulfia, Sarpaganda is the name in Sanskrit, you take the reserpine out of the Sarpaganda, then you get all kinds of side effects. And indeed, we don't use uh, reserpine anymore in the West because it makes you depressed and drops your blood pressure too much. But when you use it as a whole and together with perhaps some other drugs that support it, then it's something useful. And so that whole idea of reductionistic, he says, no, things have to be holistic in the context. And Maharshi didn't make it, okay, Ayurveda is about taking herbs. But as he introduced it, he meant Ayurveda should be about the Ritucharya, Dinacharya. And that means first you meditate and then you have a daily routine. Mm. This is the most critical thing. As a, on the basis of your meditation, then you'll go out and you'll exercise and you'll eat healthy. You'll go to bed on time. You'll keep a good daily routine and a good seasonal routine, the Ritucharya. And behavioral things, even before you start to talk about herbs and panchakarma. So, so, and so meditation on. first affects your behavior, your way of life. Right. And then you worry about it. Then you add other things. Right. Exactly. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe here and also hit the bell icon 
to make sure you get notified. To donate, please click this button.